the, the special privilege of still um, of, of presenting this while you guys still have uh, a lot of blood sugar is really high from the coffee and the donuts outside. And so I, I'm really thankful for that. And I think that was strategic. Um, and before I start, I just want to say, you know, I think I'm not qualified to be up here and, and talk to you about this. And, and for that reason, I'm very dependent on, on Christ to present to you what He's placed on my heart. And He's been so gracious over the last couple of days as I've been sitting here listening to Mike speak to confirm some of the things that I've heard um, in my heart echoing for months now leading up to this opportunity. And so the Lord is, is, is gracious to us, and, and He covers our shortcomings. And so I give Him all the glory today for, um, for what He is about to reveal um, by His Holy Spirit. So I, I want us to pray before I start, and then I'll see what, what the title is. Jesus, um, unless you show up now in me and in this moment, Lord, you know that I'm hung. Lord, and I don't want any of me here, Lord, but all of you. Come, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hey, I, I, so one of the things I want to share with you is that, that you are the salt of the earth and the light, and that God did not call us as people to, um, the world doesn't need the best version of who we are. The world needs Jesus. And, uh, and did you know that the best version of me is still far shorter of what Christ can be to the world? And so our prayer is, as believers, that when we are in the world, we do not present the best version of ourselves, perfected by um, the, the teachings of the Bible and of, of, of the morals and, and righteousness, but that we present and that the world encounters when they, when they meet us, they encounter Jesus Himself and not, you know, Jan plus or Jan on um, upgraded by his experience as a Christian. And I just want to say I'm part of the 99% of Christians who, who are not missionaries, and it is an honor and a privilege and just humbling experience to be among you here that are passionate, that are the 1% and are passionate about going out and, and have full-time ministry as in the missions field. And so I honor you today, and what I want to encourage you with is, and just being a little vulnerable, the stuff that I'm going to share with you really... I haven't figured it all out, and, but I think the Lord is working on me in a, in a powerful way to deconstruct my paradigm of what it means to be Christian and reconstruct what it means to abide in Him as a believer. Um, because I think in that there lies the mystery of our faith, um, that we are not Christians, but we are ab we're abiding in Christ. We are, we are Christ abiders. And, you know, Jesus says in John 15, 5, He says, Apart from me, you can do nothing. And if there's one thing that you can take home, uh, if there's only one thing you remember about anything I could say today, then that's that. that. That the one thing we should know is that we can do it. But only Christ can do it through us. And if we allow Him to, the, the little bit that we need to do is to lay down and say, Lord, do in me what I cannot do myself. Do in me, in, in, in my community and in the environment that I, that I am, what I cannot be. Be to the people around me what I cannot be. Because if you come and show up, then I know people will be touched. Right? So what I want to share about today is some lessons from the servant on the mount. Um, and that's the title. You know, I, I, when I typed out this title, I, I really meant to write Lessons from the Sermon on the Mount. And I, and I miss autocorrect. I don't know what happened, but I, I, I was just here pulling my notes up, and I saw that I had written Lessons from the Servant on the Mount, which is so appropriate, you know, after what we heard from Mike a minute ago. Um, 
And I've been on a journey through the Sermon on the Mount for some months now, and I, so I want to share some, a few thoughts from that. Um, you know, Jesus, that's where he, he starts off with you are, after the Beatitudes, right? He starts off with, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out. You know, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. And it says, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. You know, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but they put it on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, right? Why? So that others may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And so... This is the part that is the hard word for me, and because about right after that, Jesus goes into um, echoing the same thing over and over. He starts off saying uh, m- multiple times. He says, "You have heard that it was said," and then he says something, and then he says, "But I say to you." And so what Jesus is doing is saying, "You have heard that it was said um, that you shall not murder." But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother shall be liable for judgment. And anyone who insults his brother shall be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, shall be liable to the hell of fire. And he echoes that that statement, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you on the topic of righteousness. And he says a lot of really hard things. Um... And so when you hear, I am the salt and the light and the light of the world, and I should have my good so that they can, they can see who God is, I think we can mishear what he's really saying there. Because then when he, fought, he goes into this, uh, this echoing, these statements where he says, you have heard that it was said, uh, you shall not murder, but I say, don't be angry with your brother. You know, you have heard that it was said, um, whoever divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce, but I say to you, um, don't even, divorce should not even be contemplated, right? He says, you have heard that it was said that um, you should not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks with, at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery in his heart. Jesus takes the morality of man. He takes the righteousness that has been taught by the Pharisees and the scribes, and he takes it to a whole new level in that passage, and so when I hear, when I read this, and I go, I, sh- I am to be the salt of the earth and the light. And so in the same way, let your light shine and let your good works shine before others so that people can give glory to God. The trap that I think we all fall in as Christians is we take this really hard word from Christ and we think we have to be better at being good, right? Right? Uh, Jesus, the, the scribes and Pharisees, and he says it, he says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. But you know what? I think we have been trained to hear those words of Jesus in a certain way. And the way that I think we've been trained to hear it is in a self-righteous capacity. And so when Jesus says, you know, uh, when someone takes you to court and takes your tunic, Give him your cloak as well. You know, and if someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. When we hear that, we go, God, how can I do that? It's a hard thing when I have to muster out of myself the power and the energy to do that. And it is a hard thing. In fact, it is impossible, you know. And that's why I started off telling you that I think unless the Lord shows up in us every day, we're hung, you know. We're, unless Christ shows up in me, I fall short. And the reason I've been thinking about this is, you know, we, we live in the, in, in the States, and um, boy, I just hear a lot of, the Christian voice is just an angry voice that you hear at the moment. And a lot of Christians that are vocal on social media and in the political sphere this is an angry voice and very self-righteous and kind of judgmental. And I think Mike alluded to that last night as to the way that non-believers perceive Christians today. 
they, they perceive us in the way that we're bringing righteousness to the world, you know. And so, how do I interpret this servant that stood, you know, on the banks of the Sea of Galilee so many years ago and brought this word? How do I interpret his words when he's actually saying, but that's what I should be doing. I should be more righteous than those around me, you know. And I should be, unless my righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees. And I think the, 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 the key of that mystery lies in, in the second, in, in, in Matthew 6 on the Sermon of the Mount. And I think this is what I would like to share with you today is as servants, um, where should my righteousness, and the, the, my righteousness is what I perceive as people see of me as a Christian and a believer. The way that, that, that my, my works testify to God, right? I think that's the way that, at least from a European perspective, you know, the way that I grew up, um, that's the way that I perceive the world, is that, that if I'm a good person, then I'm most likely a Christian. And I think in, in communities where we live where there's a lot of cultural Christianity, that's how we are defined as Christians, is, you know, are you living a good life? You know, can... Uh, do you have the, the marks of a Christian on your life? Um, and so, a part of, part of what this is doing for me, what the Lord is doing, is deconstructing the traps that come with that worldview, that paradigm, that I think I have to be a good person to show the world who Christ is. And there's two passages I want to share with you out of Psalms that... Um, that I think is, is instrumental before, I, before we go into Matthew 6. Um, and, and the first is, and I'd encourage you to go here because I think there are so, the different translations that you have might, might actually under, underscore this. But go, first go to, um, actually let's first go to, to Psalm 33. And, and we're going to read out of uh, Psalm 33 verse 4 and 5. It says there, the word of the Lord is upright. And all his work is done in faithfulness. Okay? The word of the Lord is upright. Upright. Righteous. The word of the Lord is upright. And all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. Okay? He loves righteousness and justice. And then what is the next thing it says? The whole earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. So, it, so here again, the way that it characterizes God is God is characterized as being righteous and justice. He loves righteousness and justice. But how does the world perceive God? How does the world see Him? The world is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. And I think this is the, this is the mystery that lies in where if I put righteousness in the right part of my life, then I think I may be able to do it the same way where what comes out of me is not righteousness. What comes out of me is love. Let's go to the other psalm real quick, and it's Psalm 145, 145 verse 17. It says, The Lord is righteous in all His ways and kind in all his works. Okay? Hear that. The Lord is righteous in his ways. The way he is characterized. Who he is. The Lord is righteous in all his ways. But in his works, the things that come out, what you see and what you encounter is kindness. Okay? I mean, why is it that people perceive Christians as judgmental? Because we are. We conflate and confuse these things that are so subtly different. And Jesus took the time to echo, you know, you have heard that it was said, this is the way you should live. When you divorce your wife, you need to, be, to do the right thing. Give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, you know, that if you, if you, commit, if you, if you divorce your wife, you commit adultery. Boy, and so he, he takes us through one after the other. Of these, of these things that are, um, 
that, that are just a hard word, that are, that are hard to hear for us because we fall short of it, every single one of us. And then in Matthew 6, he goes and he, and he completely turns the thing on its head and now the echo is different that you see throughout the, the chapter. Now he echoes something he says, um, he'll go, um, tr- he'll, he'll say, do not be like this. Um, okay, so, so the phrase that's echoed, it goes, truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But if you do it, so he'll, so he'll say, don't be like the hypocrites who stand and pray in the synagogues and in the street corners, right? So that other people would see them. Um, truly I say to you, they've received their reward. They've received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So in Matthew 6, Jesus takes these, these acts of righteousness, praying, fasting, giving to the poor, these things that, that, that classify what, what we would define as good people. And he says, take those things and go and do them in secret when no one sees you. When you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So that your giving may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. But what we do as Christians, I think we are like the hypocrites. And when I think, well, what does it mean to be a Christian that other people can see who I am? I think I've got to display my righteousness. I've got to show how I give to the needy and to the poor. When Jesus is saying the opposite, right? He's saying, no, you should not be doing this out in public. And why is he saying that? Because he's talking about the hypocrites. Because the trap for us is that the reason that we are being righteous is not to please God, but it is to please others, you know? And I think it's so easy for us, especially, you know, in, when, we, when we start becoming a Christian and we have that purity of faith when you first n- come to know Christ. And then I think when we start going to church, there's a risk there that when you start joining church, you see, oh, these people, okay, you, you, you can't, you can't uh, there's certain words I can't use with these people, right? And there's certain things I can't talk about with, when, when I'm with these people. Why? Because it's not acceptable, because people judge me as, oh, yes, he's not quite there yet. And so we start, beha- we start modifying our behavior to be more acceptable to those around us, you know. And, and it, it's natural for us to do that. But I think what's happened in the process is that we have lost um, that purity of faith that comes initially when... I, 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 my sins, I was okay for the Lord to know my sins because His grace covered them over, you know. The law, it says in Romans 5, was sent to increase um, the trespass. The law, the law came in to increase the trespass. Um, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Let me tell you something. I think the key... F- that, that for me, is, it, the Lord is, is teaching is that it is not about how good I am as a Christian or how well I can portray my righteousness, but it is whether the, the righteousness that I love in my heart in secret and, the, and my act of service to the Lord that I do in, in the closet when no one sees me, that when I'm fasting, no one is aware of it. It is those acts of righteousness there comes out as kindness and love to the world around me. And I think if we get it right in secret, if we get righteousness right in secret when no one sees us, then the servanthood and the, and the love and kindness of God comes out on the other side naturally. Why? Because when I'm in, in my closet on my knees in prayer and no one is there to see me, there's nothing glorious about that, right? There's no reward in that with the people that are over me, that, that are kind of monitoring my progress as a Christian, right? And if I fast, and I fasted for two meals, um, but no one knows about it, boy, there's no glory in that. 
There's no glory in that from the people that, are, that I'm being discipled by. And I can't get that reward from them that says, you've done really well. And so where do I find, if I find it from Christ, if I find it from the Lord, then I think it changes my countenance when I'm, a, when I'm outside and, a, and around people. And this is the mystery. I think this is why, um, you know, as Christians, we're no less vulnerable to the, um, the strongholds of religion than the Muslims are, than uh, the Mormon faith is, than any, any of, the, of the religions that are out, that, are, that have fundamentalist roots. Why? Because we, the Lord created us with a love for morality and what is right. And so we're no less vulnerable to want to do the right thing and do it with fervor. Than, in, than any of those groups. But the difference that I think the Lord offers us is that when we are in our closet meeting with Him and that righteousness is done in secret, the difference is that we have a Father in heaven who rewards us. That is the promise of Matthew 6. Go read it. That if you do this, where your Father who is in secret sees you, then the, your Father rewards you. This servant on the mount taught us to do the things that people, ha the hooks that, that there are about what does it mean to be a Christian, to take them out of the public space. I want to challenge you to think about that. Take what you think it, it defines me as a Christian and take it out of the public space and go put it in private. Okay? Give to the needy without anyone seeing you. And go and pray by yourself in, the, in your closet. Shut your door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And when you fast, you know, anoint your head. Wash your face so that, you're, so that you do not look like the, the hypocrites because they look gloomy so that others may see that they're fasting. But you do it in private. And I think then... What will happen as a natural result of that is that the, the, the second half of, of Matthew 6, you know, um, which again, kind of a tough word, um, but, but God shows, he, he talks then about, uh, you have heard, actually this is at, at the end of Matthew 5, he says, you have heard that it was said, you know, that uh, you should love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I say to you, love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your, of your God, of your Father who is in heaven. Okay, there's a very few times when Jesus uh, gives us a f almost a formula for what does it mean to be a son of God. This is one of those very few times where it's almost formulaic. But Jesus says, pray for those, love your enemy. Love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be called sons, so that you may be sons of your Father. Why? Because God sends rain on the evil and on the good. He makes His sun rise on the evil and on the good, and He sends His rain on the just and on the unjust. God understands. You know, you look at Romans 5. For while we were yet, en for while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, for a, you, you, we could, you could still think ma dying for a righteous person, Romans 5 says, but Christ died for us while we were still sinners, while, were he, while we were still His enemies. If now, while we were His enemies, we were reconciled to Him. You know, that's why we rejoice in God. And that's what He did. So He understands more than anyone what does it mean to pray for those who persecute you. So the thing for me is um, that I really struggle with is this idea of righteousness because I'm, you know, my upbringing, I was uh, brought up in the Engierkerk, you know, um, I have been a, a, a Christian for most of as long as I can remember. And, um, and, and really the, the, the traditional um, church what it does great is be a, just a body of believers. But I think sometimes we fall into the trap of, of um, 
of modifying our behavior to be acceptable to a group of people, you know? And I, I think I struggle with this all the time as, Lord, I, I don't want to be a good person. I want to be, be Christ. Lord, I want to be in the vine. I don't want to be a good, uh, acceptable dad. I want Christ to be visible to my kids. I don't want to be a good Christian husband. I want to be Christ to my wife. And Lord, come and do in me what I cannot do myself. Because then you, if, if, if Marissa, my wife, sees Christ in me, then I know she's got everything she needs. She doesn't need me. She needs Christ. And the world and my kids don't need me. They need Christ. And so less of me, Lord, and, and more of you. And I think, um, remember Psalm 145, the Lord is just as righteous in all His ways and kind in all His acts. One last uh, one I want to sh- share with you is Romans 8, verse 20. You know, again, this is, um, this, there's a subtlety here of language that I think reveals this mystery if we lean into it, okay? Um, Romans 8, verse 20, and, and Romans 8, of course, you know, the, in the verses leading up to it, you know, I mean, let's go verse, verse 18 and 19. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Right? He is saying, this suffering that, I'm su- that we're going through now, the persecution of Christian, it is not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. The, the, the whole creation waits for eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. And then, look at, uh, at Romans 8 verse 20. If you have... If, again, if you have a Bible, go there because I think it's, it's, it's worth thinking about this. For the creation was subjected to futility. So futility, the word futility, the way I understand it, and I might be slightly off, but it suits my, my current analogy. So please correct me if I'm wrong. But the futility is just uh, there's no good outcome. Fut- it's futile, right? If I'm doing something but at, and... It's the kind of thing that you have when you, when you strive after work and at the end of the day you feel like I haven't accomplished anything. Or career. You know, how many times have you been as a, a middle-aged man, if you're 20 years into your career and you've worked into it and you feel like I, I have nothing, this hasn't brought me anything. There's nothing of value here. It says here that the creation, all of creation was subjected to futility. God created and not willingly, but because of Him who subjected it. God subjected creation to futility, not to judgment, okay? Because what, what, is, the next, what is the next section of that verse? is in hope that the creation... So God, in other words, God has, has, has allowed all the things that we do as people to result in something that's not worth anything. Why in hope? that the creation would be set free from our bondage to corruption. There's where the bondage is. The bondage is not to the judgment of God. It's to corruption. It's the sin in our lives that lead to death. Okay? And from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And so again, I, you know, this idea that I think if I can take my righteousness and the things that are on display that I feel the urge to tweet about or to post on Facebook as the Christian view of this, this topic. The trap that I think we can fall into is that we politicize, the, we politicize God. And I think what we end up with holding, there's an analogy from an old English or an old uh, classical um, uh, writer, like lived in the 200 or 300 after Christ died, and he talks about the way we should read Scripture, and he says the risk that we have if we misinterpret Scripture is, is almost like Potiphar's wife who, uh, who seduced Joseph, but she stood with his cloak in her hands. 
the risk, I think, that if we politicize Christianity, that we grasp the things of God, but we, but it's, we don't have God in our hands. And God has left the room. And we are like Potiphar's wife that, that have treated the things of God in a way that is not consistent with who He is. And so I think that's, that's the real challenge, is how do I, as a Christian, Lord, how do I be righteous in a way that calls me to the standard of righteousness that you did? You know, I can't. I cannot do it. And so unless Jesus shows up in me, you know, I'm hung. I can't do it. Unless Christ shows up in you, uh, you cannot do it. And unless He is the one who pr produces the fruit in you, um, the fruit at best is self-righteousness. It is our attempt at being good. And so I think that's the thing, you know, if, if when, I'm, when, when you have that urge to share what the right view is, what should the Christian worldview be about um, um, any contemporary issue, I would say uh, take that Christian worldview and go pray about it in private, you know. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him come to me and pray. And the God, right, God the Father will reveal wisdom to you. We live in a time more than, uh, I think, any of, of in, in our age where we get to practice Romans 14, right? Where we just don't know. Honestly, we don't know if the vaccine uh, is going to lead to all kinds of mutations. Uh, we just don't know. We need, we need 50, 60 years, you know, of data. Um, and we don't know if, if COVID-19 was born in a lab and it was a conspiracy behind it. And, uh, we just don't know. Maybe in 60 years we will all know just like they didn't know at the time whether it was okay to eat, um, you know, the, the things that, would, that were previously thought to be um, unholy, right? And so go read Romans 14, and it says, if any of you, don't, let, don't be a stumbling block for your brother. Whatever you are convicted by, by faith about the vaccine, don't be a stumbling block for your brother who might, who might have a different conviction. This is a perfect time to practice that. And so anyway, I, that's, that, was a, that was a sideshow. I think I, <laughs> the really, what I wanted to share with you is, is this idea that Jesus gave us some, a few lessons on servanthood uh, when He was on the mount sharing with us about the way that our, uh, our lives should look. And, and at first glance, he, you may read Matthew 5 as our lives should look perfect. And He kind of says that you should be perfect. But the thing is, I think He's inviting you to take that perfection and not put it on display. It's inviting you to go put it in private. And that, the, that, the, that your Father who is in secret rewards you. Because what will come out is the way that Christ is perceived, God is perceived in the world. That I see if, if the best thing for us is that if people understand that you are righteous because you love it, but that your ways are kind, and that, the earth, that, that what surrounds you is, 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 is the steadfast love of the Lord and nothing else. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much, Lord, for um, your grace and your mercy that washes over our shortcomings and our misgivings and the things and how we mess up um, this whole business of being Christian sometime. Lord, and I pray that these people that are represented here, Lord, who are... Um, who lay their lives down to you full time as missionaries. Lord, I'm, I pray that um, by your grace and your mercy that you will illuminate within them what does it mean to be a follower of Christ. And that what we have traditionally thought of as being defined as Christian, as being good, will be hidden so that there is an opportunity for your grace, your love, and your kindness to shine through. And so, Lord, I call them to righteousness in their closets. I call them to righteousness. But I, give, I pray, that, Lord, that you give them the courage to hide that righteousness, that your love and your mercy 
may be on display that the creation may be released and set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the hope of the freedom of the glory of the children of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.